Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Zoom today. Uh, my name is Lydia Webster and I'm the Assistant Curator at the Center for the Arts and Religion at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this academic panel in conjunction with the CARES Fall Exhibition, Drawing the Soul Toward Truth, Hindu and Muslim Sacred Geometry. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna let you all know about what CARE does and how you can get involved with us in other ways. Uh, there are two of us here on staff at CARE, myself and Dr. Elizabeth Pena. Uh, at CARE, we offer K, uh, courses and workshops for GTU students and the greater community, uh, two art exhibitions a year, uh, various events and panels and lectures, and also we do offer grants for GTU students as well. This semester, we have two exhibitions for you, one online and one in person, Drawing the Soul Toward Truth, uh, the exhibition we're uh, in conjunction with today can be view viewed online. And the second exhibition, Art Window, is available for viewing uh, in the ground floor window of the GTU North Building in Berkeley. Uh, and I'll put the links to learn more about both of those in the ch uh, chat box in a little bit. Um, finally, before we get started, I want to just take a moment to say thank you so much to tonight's moderator, Rochelle Saeed, who is not only the organizer of tonight's event, but the whole exhibition, uh, Drawing the Soul Toward Truth. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for all your hard work uh, in making this possible. It's been really exciting and a lot of fun. Uh, so without further ado, let me pass over to you, Rochelle, and thanks so much. Thank you so much, Lydia. What a lovely way to get started. So thank you, everyone. Welcome, like Lydia said, to the third and final event in conjunction with the exhibition Drawing the Soul Toward Truth, Hindu and Muslim Sacred Geometry. In the previous two events, we have discussed the gallery as a third space, wherein there is a free flow between different realms of meaning, which may be ultimately interconnected and shared between those engaged in dialogue. We've also discussed the diverse approaches and spiritualities of the artists who approach sacrality and faith in unique ways that offer us an opportunity to expand our understanding of others and the overall concept of aesthetics, including embodiment, as a forum for interreligious dialogue and engagement, all in response to the question, how does our engagement with the other change when we engage each other through sacred art and aesthetics? We continue exploring this topic today with the present panel, wherein we shall explore three different forms of sacred art, very broadly defined, with our honored guests. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tazim Qasim of Syracuse University, Dr. Catherine Barouche of the Graduate Theological Union, Dr. and Dr. Vijaya Nagarajan of the University of San Francisco. <clears throat> Professor Qasim is a historian of religions specializing in the Islamic tradition. Her research and teaching interests include gender, ritual, devotional literature, syncretism, and the cultural heritage of Muslims, particularly in South Asia. In her book, Song of Wisdom and Cir <clears throat> excuse me, Songs of Wisdom and Circles of Dance, she explores the origins and creative synthesis of Hindu Muslim ideas expressed in the song tradition of the Ismaili Muslims of the Indian subcontinent. She is also an editor of the 2013 volume, Lines in the Water, Religious Boundaries in South Asia, and wherein Dr. Qasim is author of The Living Tradition of Ismaili Ginans, Negotiating Cultures in Poetry and Performance. She has twice co-chaired the Study of Islam section of the American Academy of Religion, served as president of the Rocky Mountain Great Plains Regional AAR meeting, <clears throat> is a Lilly teaching scholar and is on the editorial board of the Journal of the American Academy of Religion. Her awards include fellowships from the Social Science Research Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She also pursues interests in Indian classical vocal music, using learning technologies in the classroom, and doing community service. Dr. Catherine Barouche, well received her Doctor of Philosophy from Wadham College, University of Oxford in 2012, and has held positions as postdoctoral research associate at the Center for, <clears throat> Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and as a curatorial assistant at the Yale University Center for British Art. She is also the author of the monograph, Art and the Sacred Journey in Britain, 1790 to 1850 by Rutledge. Shifting the focus to the present day, Dr. Barouche's current book project, Im <clears throat> Imaging Pilgrimage, Art as Embodied Experience, explores the transfer of spirit from sites to representations 
through a critical examination of contemporary art, including assemblages of souvenirs, built environments, and reconstructions of sacred sites created after or during pilgrimages with the intent to engender the experience for others. Dr. Baruch takes an interdisciplinary approach to art history and is especially interested in expressions of belief across a number of religious <clears throat> traditions. She values a contextual and hands-on approach to learning. Her students closely study ritual objects and sacred artworks up close and in person whenever possible. Such objects, especially in places of prayer and worship, but also as recontextualized in the secular space of public museums, offer critical, crucial insights into the study of historic and contemporary lived religion, devotional practice, and popular piety. In addition to her research and writing, Dr. Baruch is an advisor to the British Pilgrimage Trust and a member of the advisory network of the Yale Center for Material and Visual Cultures of Religion. She is also an avid walker and has led a group of graduate student pilgrims along the Camino Ignacio in Spain. Dr. Vijaya Nagarajan is an associate professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies and in the Program of Environmental Studies at the University of San Francisco. In addition to teaching, she has also taught at the University of California, Berkeley and Harvard University. Dr. Nagarajan's academic interests weave among the fields of Hinduism, environment, gender, ritual, and the commons. She received her PhD in South Asian language and literatures from UC Berkeley and has received grants, fellowships, and awards from the University of San Francisco, such as the Davies Chair, Harvard University, UC Berkeley, Fulbright Hayes, Oxford University, the American Institute of Indian Studies, the California Tamil Academy, the American Academy of Religion, the Jirasi Resident Artist Program, and Mesa Refuge. Dr. Nagarjan has been devoted to the environmental movement for several decades in both India and the Bay Area. She is the co-founder of the Recovery of the Commons Project and the Institute for the Study of Natural and Cultural Resources, where she has co-organized events with a large range of scholars, activists, and artists. Her book, Feeding a Thousand Souls, Women, Ritual, and Ecology in India, an Exploration of the Kolam, was published in the fall of 2018. Every day, millions of Tamil women in Southeast India wake up before dawn to create the kolam, a ritual design made of rice flour on the thresholds of homes. This thousand-year-old ritual welcomes and honors the goddesses Lakshmi and Budevi. Propelled by a lifelong wonder and fueled by a deeply informed research, Dr. Nagarajan provides a poetic and surprising entryway into the layered complexities of this ritual practice. Braiding Tamil women's voices and the author's own stories, Feeding a Thousand Souls brings into conversation different knowledge traditions, including beauty, history, literature, religion, anthropology, mathematics, and ecology. We are also pleased to welcome Justin Zoli, who will offer a response following our panel, which will also launch our Q&A. Justin Michael Zoli is an American visual artist based in San Francisco Bay, California. Justin studied visual art at Rhode Island School of Design and Massachusetts College of Art, Boston, and attained his BFA at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and Tufts University. Justin is presently completing coursework at the Dominican School of Theology and Philosophy at the GTU in Berkeley, where he is working towards his MA in Aesthetics in the Department of Art and Religion. Justin's research interest is in the sacred temples and mural painting practices of ancient cultures, and this has included extensive travel tours throughout the world. In 2014, Justin traveled to India and undertook private studies with the renowned artist and academic professor Om Prakash Sharma, one of India's most prominent abstract artists and a founder of the Neo-Tantra movement in painting and retired president of the National College of Art in Delhi. This life-changing experience and the Guru Shishya teacher-student relationship they shared altered the course of Justin's own creative work and two years later culminated in his organizing of a large exhibition of 80 of Ohm's paintings in Marin, California. Om Prakash passed of old age in 2019 and Justin continues to promote the genius and message of Ohm's artistic accomplishment to U.S. audiences. Justin kindly submitted some of Om Prakash's work for Drawing the Soul Toward Truth, and we are grateful to be able to share these extraordinary works with our audience. And now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Tazim Kassam. Thank you so much. Uh, I, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this creative endeavor um, that is particularly needed in our times right now of division and strife. 
not only do we need to have civil dialogue um, between religious communities, but also political parties, racial and ethnic groups, etc. And hopefully this presentation will offer some insights for bridging divides leading to more harmonious exchanges. I was puzzled when uh, Rachel contacted me to be part of this panel in the overall context of the exhibition on artists' works on sacred geometry. However, when viewed in the context of interfaith dialogue or even broadly intercultural dialogue, there's no question that the arts are a fertile space and medium for exchange. And indeed, as the title for this initiative expresses for drawing the soul towards truth. Geometry is the most elemental or abstract of these media and its principles of harmony, balance, coherence, and even dynamism radiate out into arts, including the performing arts. The spirit and dynamics of geometry can be expressed through magnificent church, mosque, or temple architecture, ornate designs on ceramic tiles, ceremonial dress, and illuminated texts, as well as the harmonics of sacred music, the circular dances and rituals, and the oral performances of myths. It goes without saying that regardless of their form, music and dance are historically universal to every culture. As performing arts, they are distinct from such religious forms as written texts, religious art, artifacts, and architecture. They are experiential in an immediate sense, expressing emotions and feelings, involving the whole body, and taking place within a communal context. That is, the performer and audience are an integral, mutually reinforcing unit. They can incorporate words and sounds carried by the human voice. I deliberately chose the title Singing Circles and Circular Dance for this talk to capture the spirit of a cycle of hymns or sacred songs called garbis that are part of a living tradition of devotional and wisdom poetic songs called ginans belonging to the Shia Ismaili Muslim community. These religious songs originated in South Asia and have been recited and performed by the community for well over eight centuries. They are both oral and literary poetic compositions in a polyglot of Hindi, Gujarati, Saraiki, and Sindhi languages with vocabulary peppered with Farsi, Arabic, and Sanskrit words. The linguistic character conveys the diversity of audiences the Muslim composers known as peers addressed or at least had in mind when they composed them. Like other Muslim fakirs and saints, the Ismaili peers who came into the Indian subcontinent from Iran and Afghanistan spread their religious teachings through poetry, storytelling, and musical performance that were deeply influenced by and embedded in their local religious and cultural environment. And at the same time, they also contributed to and reshaped these existing traditions and indeed gave rise to new ones. Think, for example, of the Sufi performance of Qawwali in shrines or dargahs of Muslim saints in North India. Similarly, the Garbis and Ginans composed by the Ismaili peers were set to melodies and recited communally for centuries, which helped retain their essential integrity. And that continues to be a vibrant, central, and inspirational devotional practice of ritual life in the present Ismaili community. The communal belief was that the songs were sacred since they were composed by inspired Muslim saints who had a high spiritual status. And moreover, the Ginans were represented by the peers themselves as being equal to, if not the true essence of the Vedas or Hindu scriptures. The Garbis are unique in the context of the Ginans in that at least at the time of their composition, they appear to have accommodated dance as part of their performance. At present, the Garbis are recited in places of assembly and prayer or jamatkanas without accompaniment of dance or music. But in their content, melody and rhythm, they gesture towards performance. And these days, typically, they might be recited with music, but during special festivals called koshalis. And the Garbi dance is still very popular among the Shia Ismaili Muslim community. Now to set the context for the Garbis attributed to Pir Shams, a little background to the form is appropriate. And for those of you who do uh, a lot in South Asian studies, um, this might be you know, common knowledge. So the Garbis are part of a lively tradition of song and dances performed in Gujarat at the celebration of Navratri, 
a nine-day festival dedicated to the goddess Durga. Each night involves a puja ceremony to one of her nine forms or manifestations. And although there are regional variations in terms of myths and religious figures, the central theme of the festival is the victory of good over evil. Now, in the case of the goddess Durga, the festival celebrates her vanquishing the shapeshifter buffalo demon Mahashura. And the grand culmination of the festival occurs on the 10th day called Dasara, when the goddess is either submerged into the ocean or burned in an effigy, symbolizing the completion of her victory over the demon, achi achieving the triumph of good over evil, and restoring dharma or cosmic order and righteousness. In Gujarat, which is the location of the Garbis of Pir Shams, at least in former times and perhaps still in some villages, the festival involved women dancing in a circle around a clay pot called Garbha, which has holes on the side and a lighted candle called Deep inside. Sometimes the women carry smaller ones on their heads. Garbha literally means womb and the sim symbolism is of life and the creative female power of the deity in this case Durga, that manifests in that light. And the songs sung while they danced are called Garbi. Uh, the Garba together with another form called Dandia, which is played with sticks, has become a wildly popular dance that occurs in a variety of secular contexts, including at weddings and other celebrations without necessarily having any religious connotation. Uh, can we go to the slides, please? So um, to the, the next slide, thanks. So in South India, uh, a regional variation of the festival of Navrati is typically devoted to the legend of Vishnu in his avatar as Ram, who rescues Sita from the demon, demon Ravana. Now it's interesting that the Gujarati Garba in Dandia has transplanted itself and now become very popular there. And notice at the center of the circle is what looks like an installation of the mythical scene from the Ramayana. Our next slide. Now, uh, before we play this, this is actually a video, uh, a short preview of the film Helaro, but it offers a great example of the traditional folk dance performed in Gujarat. In this case, though, the song anticipates the coming of the woman's hero mounted on a horse. And instead of earthen pots, the women are carrying copper water pots. And a hallmark of Gujarati Garba festivals and dance are the lively rhythms and the participants' colorful costumes. Now, can we play the video, please? Is there any sound? I'm 
So thank you. So uh, what you saw there in the second portion was what's called dandia, which was traditionally performed by the men using sticks. So moving on to uh, the next slide. Um, yeah, now this is a painting. Um, um, it, it, this is sort of an introduction, a segue into the, the um, Garbis of Pir Shams. Uh, this is an artistic imagining of the setting that the Pir encountered. And as you, you know, in the painting, you can see the white figure, uh, he's at the center of the circle together with the drummer and he's singing the Garbis. The, the Durga temple is to the right of the painting and at the top are onlookers, which are a combination of villagers and uh, the pundits who are at least within the context of the Garbis watching the event with some astonishment since he is a Muslim saint. Now the Garbis recited by the Ismailis in the Jamaat Khanas are part of the daily ritual. Uh, but as mentioned previously, they are not accompanied by music and dance. And it is unknown whether in previous centuries the Ginans and Garbis were recited with musical accompaniment. Uh, the tune of each Garbi is different, as, as, as are other religious compositions by the peers called Ginans. I'm now going to play a recitation of a Garbi by a young Ismaili sin singer, as it would be uh, sung in the Jamaat Khana. Notice though, though it has a rhythm, uh, it is at a much slower pace. <laughs> okay, we have a problem here. Sorry, just a sec. No, this is not working. I apologize. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So, um, yeah, so the translation of the Garbi she just sung shows several key features. The first one is the term Satgur, uh, or true guru, that essentially becomes the central figure in the Garbis, displacing uh, the Garbha, or the pot symbolizing the goddess Durga. And the peer conveys that the true focus of the dance is not Durga, but the true guru or Satgur, who is later identified as Ali, um, the first Shia Imam. And the peer says it is the Satgur, a living entity, not the statue which bears divine light or nur. Although this Garbi disavows and displaces the deity Durga, it simultaneously creates a bridge or several bridges to the existing situation. And this is a fundamental feature of the Garbis and Ginans, that is the use of terms and ideas that are familiar and easily accessible to the audience. When a new term is introduced, such as in this case, the sond or the tithe, it is usually accompanied by a cognate like dana, which means offering or donation or gift. So the concept is clearly graspable. Another central feature in this Garbi is the introduction of the term satpanth, or true path, which marks the inauguration of a new community. Both words, sat meaning truth or true, and pant meaning path, are Hindi or Gujarati words familiar and meaningful to the audience. So for instance, it, the, the peer might have used the word sirat al-mustaqim, which means straight path, but we find um, generally that the terms that are integral to the environment are ones that are used. Uh, may we go to the next slide? So um, the next recitation of Garbi is accompanied with music. 
and would be performed in a community hall, for example, during a festival celebrating the visit of the living Imam, but not within the Jamaat Khana. And though very popular, such performance would not be part of a religious ceremony. <laughs> So in this karbi, a very important connection is made. The peer introduces the word ginan, which are the religious compositions of forms that he signals he will be delivering his sermons or teaching in. Also notice the peer says he has come to hold the women's hands. That is, this is not a violent imposition of his message, but an attempt to lead through understanding or explanation. A central connection by which he makes this point is by referencing the Vedas, the sacred scripture of the Hindus, which if they study carefully, he says, they will realize the Ginans contain the essence. Next slide, please. Now, this is again a, um, a, a recitation and you, you can notice the change in tune, which are passed down from generation through generation. <laughs> So in this uh, Garbi, the peer notes that reciting uh, his compositions will bring merit, punya, and then reaffirms this path, satpant, that he has introduced, introduced to them through the, the Garbis. The central point made clear in this particular Garbi is the identification of the true guru as being Ali, the first Shia Imam, which clearly shifts the identity from a Hindu to a Muslim frame. And he goes on to say that the Satgur or Ali's Das or devotee will attain heaven by following him. And here to note that the word for heaven is Vaikuntha or not Janat, which would be the Farsi or Urdu equivalent. Next slide, please. So this diagram, uh, this, and this is the final slide, this diagram illustrates the remarkable transformation uh, and creative synthesis that the Muslim prepare through the Garbis and Ginans has accomplished not through destruction, but a careful reformation and accommodation of existing concepts and practices in the environment in which he found himself. So the success of the endeavors of these Ismaili peers are the legacy of a corpus of literature or compositions and the new community they initiated called Satpant. And eventually as the community develops, the identification with the Ismaili tradition becomes a bit sharp comes sharper into focus. 
And this was accomplished remarkably through a typical musical, poetic, and dance form integral to and in harmony with the Gujarati Hindu's cultural ethos. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Baruch, please go ahead. Yep. Let's see, can everyone see my slides? Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Dr. Kassam, that was fascinating. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank Rochelle Saeed for the invitation to participate in the panel for the drawing of the Soul Towards Truth exhibition. And I also wanna congratulate Rochelle and the artists that are featured in the exhibition and the GTU Center for Art and Religion, because I think that they've managed to create a truly sacred space in the virtual environment. And what I love most about the exhibition is that rather than being an imperfect carbon copy of an in-person gallery show, it actually uses the online environment to its advantage. The sacred forms that are featured can be viewed anywhere on a home computer, on a mobile device while pausing on a hike for a moment of meditation and reflection, in bed while convalescing, or in a busy office while seeking a, a moment of solace. Um, and here's my three-year-old son uh, testing out <laughs> some of the uh, exhibition features. Some of the artwork that is born digital benefits from being viewed on a screen. Of course, a visit to our own brick and mortar, beloved Doug Adams Gallery here in Berkeley is a beautiful experience. If you close your eyes, you can imagine the sunlight, the wooden floors, the gentle echo of the open space, but shifting the exhibition online has made it more accessible for those who wouldn't have been able to travel to Berkeley. In this time of pandemic, it's truly open to all. And this brings me to the subject of my talk today, which is on the pilgrimage of the eye. While I will highlight a few examples from the exhibition and beyond, my overarching point is more general. What I'm going to argue for is an idea of ocular circumambulation. That is to say, the possibility of viewing art and especially the sacred geometric forms inspired by Islam and the Dharma religions as a way to engender a truly embodied experience of sacred travel. Pilgrimage is not just important in these religions, but integral to them. The Hajj or journey to Mecca is a religious milestone for Muslims the world over. Hinduism encourages yatra or sacred pilgrimages to sites like the river Ganges and has been doing so since Vedic times. Both traditions share that these journeys are a way to encounter the presence of the divine. Pilgrims bear witness to a living and active God. Many religious major, many major religious foot pilgrimages have been canceled or curtailed in an effort to contain the spread of COVID-19. These have included the Hajj and the Hindu pilgrimage known as the Armanath Yatra high in the mountains of Kashmir. Also notable are the curtailed Catholic pilgrimages to Lourdes in France and along the Camino de Santiago. Pilgrims have faced travel delays and cancellations for centuries. Reasons have ranged from financial hardship and agricultural responsibilities to what is now all too familiar to modern day pilgrims, plague or ill health. Then as now, one strategy has actually been to bring um, the pilgrimage home or into the religious community. Of course, pilgrimage can be an interior or outward journey, and while individual motivations may vary, it can be an act of religious devotion or a way to seek closeness with the divine. Through centuries and across cultures, those who long to go on a sacred journey would find alternative ways to do so reading travel narratives, tracing a map with the finger or with the eye, or holding a souvenir brought back from a sacred site helped facilitate a real sense of travel for the homebound pilgrim. And this is what I, the point that I wanna to make tonight is that pilgrimage can also be mediated through art, including types of paintings featured in Drawing the Soul Towards Truth. Through these visual or material aids, people felt though they too were having a pilgrimage experience and even connecting to others. Many cultures have some version of a path that exists outside of, but is connected to a sacred center that can be negotiated through an embodied viewing experience or physically walking. One circular geometric form with a circuitous path that appears in medieval Christian sacred architecture is the labyrinth, the labyrinth and this is um, an image from Chartres Cathedral in France. There has been a recent proliferation of modern labyrinths embedded in pavement, built of stone, 
sculpted in clay or, um, or mowed actually, mowed with a lawnmower into turf. At my uh, progressive um, public high school in Vermont, there are actually clay finger labyrinths that were affixed to hallways for stress relief for students. It's a great idea, actually. And uh, these are also often used in senior centers to engender a sense of pilgrimage for the visually impaired or differently abled pilgrim. The sculptural tactility of some of these contributions, um, the, the tactility of finger labyrinths, here's a picture of a finger labyrinth, um, brought to mind actually some of the art of Salma Arastu in the exhibition, and the Divine Square in particular seems to invite this kind of tactile experience. Labyrinths are often popularly imagined as scaled-down pilgrimages to Jerusalem or even through the cosmos, although this is yet to be uh, definitively proven. Nevertheless, they've begun to be instated in environments like public parks and hospitals, and the practice of negotiating these sacred spaces has been adopted widely as part of meditative practices across a diversity of religious traditions. It would actually be a compelling project to examine a contemporary labyrinth or labyrinth-like form used by practitioners of multiple religions as a nexus for a dialogical approach to comparative religion. As one pilgrim reflected, what is most precious to me is that the labyrinth is not attached necessarily to a religion, but has a wider and more personal spiritual quality. It is not required that one know a certain prayer, have certain parents, or be baptized. The only requirement is putting one foot in front of the other. The richness of labyrinths as a mode of dialogical encounter, but also their relationship to the sacred geometry of the Dharma religions emerged not too long ago at the Meilenberg Koenig uh, History of Religion Seminar at the San Francisco Theological Seminary in April of 2016. I presented a paper on labyrinths that have begun cropping up at specifically Ignatian uh, retreat centers and a lively discussion emerged about parallel practices and other traditions that penetrated beyond form or format into ideas of ritual praxis and belief. Um, my colleague, Dr. Purushottam Abilamoria, who is a scholar of Indian philosophy and ethics at the Mira and A.J. Shingle Center for Dharma Studies here in Berkeley, drew out some really fascinating conjunctions between Buddhist sand mandalas and their relationship to the Patala Palace, but he also discussed the tantric meditative visualization practices in the Dharma traditions. The Jain practice, of erecting mandalas of the universe, often made of marble, that he described is perhaps the most similar in terms of both method and goals. There's a mandala in the form of a person from torso to leg standing on a geometric representation of Mount Miru, where the material universe is said to have begun. And I'll just read out this quote from um, Professor Bill Amoria's response to my paper. He said, one makes the journey in imaginative phases of meditation and espousing and imaginatively the dispersal of vows as one moves through the many worlds inhabited by all kinds of creatures with whom peace, pact of non-injury and show of empathy has to be affected. Many conversations take place and the soul is cleansed as well as expanded to encompass the bigger, higher world it experiences, leaving behind the old habits and desires and material clingings. The final stop is the Siddhalakas, the dwelling space of the enlightenment ones where one longs to be and one must one day through the linear pilgrimage of life and up at. So note here the conjunction of the metaphor of the pilgrimage of life, the geographic locus, in this case, Mount Miru, and the cosmological significance that leads to an ascent of the spirit and attention to the vibrant matter of the created universe. It is not a superficial comparison. As Professor Bill Amoria concluded, the parallels are stunning and remarkable, and I'm left wondering if there is a universality in the mature spiritual practice and liminal communitas, human beings strive to articulate and find their ways through more than one, through more than the secular materialist world would acknowledge. This substantiates the claim that such objects can generate rich interreligious dialogue through embodied encounter. Laura Dunn, who I saw is actually with us this evening, um, and not to put her on the spot, she's one of our esteemed PhD candidates at the GTU, and also the editor of the Journal of Dharma Studies, has been working on a project that has included interviewing practitioners at the Rudra Mandir here in Berkeley, actually just down the street from where I'm zooming in tonight. And they speak of their experience of Shakti as an embodied sensation. They describe a heightening of vision, sometimes seeing orbs of fire, with Laura's permission, I quote her autoethnographic description of what she personally experienced. I too noticed an ever intensifying halo of light that appeared to engulf the furniture walls and orange robes. 
the field of light was like a flash of a camera within which all objects washed away in a field of luminescence. Such experiences point to the Tantraloka's claim that Shakti manifests as the divine power that flows through the senses. And in the case of Darshan and other visualization practices, the faculty of sight is a particularly potent avenue upon which to experience the movement from difference to openness. And in reading this, I was struck with the similarities with 12th century mysticism in which the eye is the origin of a cycle of vision leading to the soul. The theologian Hugh of St. Victor described the activation of an eye within that can touch, produce light, and behold past, present, and future all at once. In the writings of Hugh and Richard of St. Victor, the first stage of corporeal vision involved the eye of the flesh seeing the form and image of rational things. In the second stage, the imagination was activated so that the mystical significance was perceived in things. Continuing the ascent, the third stage was characterized by perceiving the spirit of the truth hidden in things by means of forms and figures and similitude, followed by the final mystical stage, the pure and naked seeing of divine reality. And I was also reminded of the theory of extra mission, which I'm showing here in the slide. Um, which posits that rays of light emit from the eyes and can negotiate surfaces, quite literally touching them in a process of visual tactility. The origins of extramission have a home in the writings of Aristotle, but these ideas reemerged in the 15th century in the writings of Leonardo da Vinci and others. The point here is that there seems to be a philosophy of the eye as a site of an expansive cycle of vision that touches the soul to create an embodied experience which crosses culture and time. Quite literally, it is a drawing of the soul towards truth. The pilgrimage of the eye or the brush is a journey for both the artist and the beholder, and maybe Justin can say something about that later. And so for the remainder of my time today, which is just gonna be two more minutes, um, I just wanna highlight a few more examples of art in the exhibition that, ex that explicitly address this in their tactility, the idea of map journeys, and light as a divine channel to the soul of the beholder. The pieces that I'm just going to flip through very quickly hold in common an engenderment of the idea of sacred journey, both in the process of creating them as described by the artists and in their form, they are to borrow from Baudelaire, an invitation to a voyage. As I show these next slides, see if you can become aware of your eye movements. Where did they land? How did they travel across the piece? How did you feel as you touched the paintings and sacred geometric forms with your eyes? Where did your eye land? Where is it going now? This is a piece called Hidden Treasure by artist Vera Vendendries. She engages the archetypal forms of the yantra, which she describes as a centering device or as a composition of the energy pattern of a deity. Her art engenders the constructs that we have been discussing. It is meant to lead the viewer beyond the material construct of the world, the divinity within. The anthropologist Victor and Edith Turner have written extensively on art associated with pilgrimage sacred symbols, they write, lead to a sympathy between the pilgrim and others. The trials of the long route create an openness and vulnerability that may not have been in place before embarking on the journey. Whether Vendedri's art is encountered in situ in a meditation space or on a computer screen, like now or an iPhone, it invites an experience of pilgrimage with the artist acting as guide as Vendendries wrote of this piece, the artist intuits the divinity within through form and color and invites the viewer to be a participant in this discovery, again, an invitation to a voyage. I spoke earlier about labyrinths and images of Mount Miro as a way of mapping sacred, mapping sacred the cosmos, mapping the sacred cosmos. This is precisely what is going on in the geometric matrices and the art of Abhishek Ghosh. I'm showing the piece Kaleidoscope. Is your eye drawn from the pink into the receding center point? What will you find there? Ghosh writes that this piece is an assimilation of both Hindu and Muslim religio-cultural art forms adopted from architecture. This geometric feature visualizes an imagination of constellations with different, infinite, mythical, and geometric representations like the labyrinths and the ancient Jain maps of the cosmos, which invite an embodied experience, 
Gosha's art participates in what it represents. It participates in what it represents. The description of his other piece in the exhibition draws on this language of pilgrimage and sacred travel. In the piece Constellation, he writes, the piece Constellation is a holistic approach to visualizing the infinite mystery in a perceptible way, leading us beyond the earthly complexes towards harmony and the endless journey for truth. So you can then again see the rhetoric of this, um, of the sacred journey used in the description. There's a relationship here also to Zara Amar's piece, Woven Number 22, which invites the viewer to gravitate toward light. She is inspired by the sky, the cosmos again, and the piece is not a figurative copy of the sky, but rather a continuity of God's creation. Woven Number 26 takes us from the firmament to the earth, to the mountains and the seas, Oops, from the mountains to the seas, the forests, the cliffs, and the plains. Our eye is the pilgrim voyager, and a Mars watercolor brush is our guide. So to finish up, I began with discussing the democratizing possibilities of Rochelle's online exhibition, how it can both travel with the viewer, for an example, on a mobile phone, and also incite an experience of travel. As I mentioned, this has become especially salient in this time of global pandemic. Fariba Abedin's piece, Geometry Number 206, addresses this directly. It was painted during the lockdown. It has balanced visual elements and bright harmonious colors to uplift the energy of the viewer, Abedin writes, serving as a spiritual journey. As with so many pieces in the exhibition, the artwork in this way becomes a sacred site in and of itself. The artist is guide and the beholder is an explorer, engendering a pilgrimage of the eye. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Baruch. Dr. Nagarjan? Thank you very much um, for inviting me, uh, Rachel Syed, and uh, the Center for Art and Religion. And it's really an honor um, to be a part of this exhibition and a part of this whole panel. Um, and I hope at some point, uh, you know, we can, I know we had really talked about bringing the columns, um, which I have studied, the Women's Ritual Art Tradition of South India, to the exhibition. I hope sometime we can do that in the post-pandemic. Um, times. So I wanted to just begin, let's see, I'm going to just share the screen. Okay. okay, here we go. Even one's own tradition, this is a quote from a dear friend and mentor and teacher of mine, some of you might know, um, A.K. Ramanujan. Um, who taught at Chicago and was a brilliant translator of ancient Tamil poetics and a great inspiration for my work. Even one's own tradition is not one's birthright. It has to be earned, repossessed. The old bards earned it by apprenticing themselves to the masters. One chooses and translates a part of one's past to make it present to oneself and maybe to others. One comes face to face with it, sometimes in faraway places, as I did. Every day in Southern India, millions of women wake up before dawn, dreaming of drawing designs filled with their desires for the well-being of themselves, their communities, and the world at large. These designs, the columns, on the thresholds of homes, temples, and businesses are ephemeral. They're gone a few hours later, rice dust on the feet of passers-by, blessing both the ritual drawers and those who see them. I'm just going to show you a little video of a simple um, column, just so you can experience it. Thank <laughs> you. 
So I'm just going to leave it on this slide. You can see that there's a grid of dots or pulleys in Tamil um, for these particular kinds of columns, which are called pulley columns. Um, and they are, you know, framed by a grid, grid of dots. And then usually it's one continuous line. Um, so this is one of the most beautiful columns I saw. And you'll see a range of, you know, very complex and simple columns that I'll show you. Um, so these designs, the columns on the thresholds of homes Temples and businesses are ephemeral. They're gone a few hours later, rice dust on the feet of passers-by, blessing both the ritual drawers and those who see them. The column is created by Tamil women in Tamil Nadu, the southeastern state of, Tamil, of India, and wherever Tamils have migrated, northern India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, England, the United States, and elsewhere. In the Tamil language, the other classical language in India besides Sanskrit, the word column means beauty, form, play, disguise, and ritual design. These column designs and what they mean to the women who draw them um, taught me so much. Um, and mainly women told me the following about what these columns mean to them. They often said it was to do something beautiful every morning. And I should note that they're done before sunrise in the old days, not so much anymore. They're done during the, during the morning, um, now after sunrise, but they used to be done before the first rays of the sunlight hit the front threshold of the house. And it was an honoring of the sun god as well, of Surya. So I often think of them as a parallel to the Sunni Namaskaram in yoga traditions. Um, they often told, taught me to do some, that they, the columns were done to do something beautiful, to invite, welcome, and host the goddess of wealth, good luck, wellness, and alertness, Lakshmi, it was also done to banish, to unwelcome, and de-host Mudevi, who is the goddess of poverty, misery, bad luck, sickness, and laziness, and sleepiness, which you want to get rid of in your body as you wake up in the early morning. Um, they were also done to catch the negative effects of the evil eye, jealousy, and envy of those who intend harm, both those you know and strangers. So these, these designs were considered to be complicated enough to catch those negative emotions at the threshold of your house. They were also done to embody Ganesha, the elephant-headed god, the remover of obstacles. And they were done to indicate auspiciousness or mangalam, well-being, and to prevent suffering and death. So they were literally messages conveyed to the rest of the world that morning that if there is a column done, that there has been no death in the household the night before. If the column is not done, it's often a signifier of some kind of sorrow or suffering or some kind of inability of the household to be able to give dana to strangers. So if there are beggars who are walking or, or sa saints or sages who are uh, carrying their begging bowls, um, if they don't see a kolam, they will not beg at that house. Because at that time, if there's no kolam, it means that the household is in an act of receiving dana and not have the capacity to give. Um, but if the kolam is there, that means that this household is ready to give to strangers, um, which I think is an amazing sort of grammar of hospitality that is shown you know, at the threshold of the house. Um, women also taught me that it, the kolam was done for play, just a simple pleasure of play. Also, the, one of the first Tamil women to do the kolam was a ninth century saint, Andal, um, who sought to be one of the first column makers. And very importantly to me at this time that we're living in, the column is also done to remember every morning to, and to ask for forgiveness to the earth goddess, Budevi, for our walking and stepping and spitting on her. And also to feed a thousand souls, which is where the title of my book comes from. Throughout India, bright colors of red ochre, vermilion, golden turmeric, and great white ash powders splash the surfaces of foreheads and bodies, stones and temples. These designs range from the thin red U-shaped markings 
to three parallel horizontal lines to a smudge of filled red circles on the foreheads. Hours later, these dab markers are worn down to a light tincture. These particular ritual markings are often red and made of saffron and turmeric and are also called kungumam. Along a similar vein, hundreds of millions of Hindu women draw these ritual pattern designs on the thresholds of houses, businesses, trees, and temples. They're called by many names. And what's interesting is the, the root, uh, the linguistic roots of each of these words are very, very different from each other. So it seems that they had independent sources of becoming. They're called, Kolam in, they're called Kolam in Tamil Nadu, Satya in Gujarat, Mandana in Rajasthan, Alpana in Bengal, Mugu in Andhra Pradesh, and Chitta in Orissa, and Rangoli, which is the most popular name, in Karnataka, Gujarat, Maharashtra, and UP, and elsewhere. These Indian ritual designs are also in kinship with those much farther away, such as Tibetan sand mandalas of ephemeral power in South Asia, which was mentioned earlier, Navajo sand paintings made by medicine men for healing illnesses in the Southwestern United States, Soma ritual drawings, with parallel mathematical properties to these pulli columns, in fact, in Angola on the African continent, there are also calms or chokes drawn on thresholds by pre-Christian women to protect the household from harm in Wales and England, which were made even as late as the 1930s, um, which really surprised me. You know, I didn't expect to find uh, a cousin of these designs in Wales and in England. Column designs are many and varied. Many, most are geometric and involve dots, curved lines, squares, and triangles. There may be two opposing triangles facing each other, intertwined. One triangle is seen as male and the other as female, equal and opposing forces in tension and balance. Sometimes there are complex, unbroken lines looping around a matrix of dots, like the one you see here, or flattened trap trapezoidal geometric structures facing the center. And it's interesting from the, an echo from the talk before, um, sometimes women would say that, you know, this, literally these designs were made at, right after you brush your teeth, you wake up from the bed and you brush your teeth and then you, you take your rice flour, um, you know, can and you go and make these. Um, and, you know, they often said that it was as if, as powerful as doing a pilgrimage to the Ganga. So that in the center of these designs is imagined Benares and the river Ganga uh, and, and whatever sacred rivers may be close. Um, so it's an interesting kind of um, echoing, you know, uh, from the earlier talk that Dr. Baruch did. Um, let me just move to the next one. Um, this is my mother. Um, speaking of the Smithsonian, this is one of the seeds of this, of this work um, in, in the Festival of India in 1985. So that's how I got interested in them. Even though I watched my mother make them throughout my life, I wasn't um, that engaged with the meaning of them. Uh, and so here she's describing, and um, as I was doing these lectures on the column, I found that there was really not much written on them. So that made my curiosity grow. So this is during the Festival of Pongal, which happens actually soon in another in mid-January, um, and it's the, it's the height of the kola making season. Um, and you see the variety of columns across the village street. Um, and you see, you know, young boy, little boy standing on one of them. You see a simple one, which is like the two triangles facing each other, um, etc. So each woman is choosing what kind of design to make. But there's a general generative grammar of a language of symbols within which that freedom is expressed. Um, here's a lovely labyrinth column as well, the dot column. Um, and here's a whole group of people, make, you know, women making it. Um, so it can, it's a community activity as well as a singular activity as well. This one I love. I mean, I love the expression of the happiness of this woman going to get her water. But it's also reminiscent of one of the things that women ask when I would ask them what the meaning of uh, the columns were. And this one really gives... Um, uh, a kind of uh, glimpse of this, often women would say that it was done to capture a fold of the cloth of infinity. 
And so here you can see, this is like a, a, a lotus flower that expands, you know, at all dimensions. And so um, I was very moved by that um, description by many women that it's that you're trying to remember, uh, you know, the, the experience of infinity and capturing that so that those who see it have the darshan of the kolam also understand and remember that we are in these folds of infinity and that the woman who's making it is also you know, remembering that as well. Um, and let me. And I want to just show this because you see how the back is bent um, so well to make this column. And so um, one of the important things is the spine and how you bend the spine. And my mother would do the columns until she was 80. I mean, she's 84 now. And so, and she could easily bend. It was only at the age of 80 that she found it hard to bend over like this. So it's pretty amazing, you know, in terms of um, the capacity of folding the body. And, and then you also see, with, saw with the video, how easy the fingers move through time and space. That was not a speeded up video. That was an actual time. So a real time video. So it shows the intense practice that goes into making these columns. And I often joke that it takes about six years from the age of six to 12 uh, to become really competent at making columns, almost like the equivalent of a PhD. Um, not quite, but <laughs> almost. <laughs> and so here you see the ephemerality of it and how it um, disappears, you know, after and you have bikes and cars and everything uh, going on it. Here you also see, here you see an interesting square column. So some of these square columns uh, not this one in particular, but they look very similar to a top view of the architectural design of a temple. I'll show you some others. But here, it's interesting that there is a both figurative lotus flower expanding from the specific kata column of the square column. So this is very unusual to have that kind of combination of the both. But you can also see the infinity there too, the plane of infinity. Here you see the gopurams. So this is what I meant by the architectural columns. These are called katta columns or square columns. And so the basic uh, grammar is this, the interior structure, but then you have that kind of almost like a fold out of the gopurams of the tall towers of the South Indian temples. And then, um, you know, uh, people hate to be lonely in, in India. So even the columns have companion columns so that they're not lonely. So there's little columns surrounding the, the bigger columns so they don't get lonely just by being big in themselves. <laughs> Here you see the Pongal, the harvest festival, and you see all the activity on the columns. Here's a column competition. Um, and so here's a, that also happens. Um, and there's also figurative columns. So they're very modern columns. And you just really see projected women's desires onto the columns. And again, here's a funny one with the snowshoes and a Swiss um, girl. <laughs> and of course, in a very heat, the heat of South India, snow can be very desirous and cold. So, <laughs> and I just love this temple elephant and the, and the bindi on the temple forehead. So I did a lot of interviews of this temple elephant. Um, and also the idea of the feeding a thousand souls that, um, I mean, what really became, stunning to me as I got deeper and deeper into the column was that I started seeing that the column was one of the many rituals of generosity and enactment and performance of general of, of rituals of generosity. So rituals of generosity to strangers or to stranger souls, whether they're animal or human, that had no possibility of any reciprocal giving back to you. So it was a non-reciprocal gift giving, which is, of course, the highest order. So here you have also crows being fed, and this can be done by men and women, um, but this is often done at the temples, and this was in the Mailapur temple, but it's done in many temples. And also you even see this theme in, in you know, Bollywood movies of, of uh, you know, men uh, feeding um, birds um, every day. I think maybe that's the last one. I thought there was more. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. And there's, this is a really beautiful one, very elaborate in the Madurai uh, temple. Um, 
And one of the chapters I have in my book is about mathematics and the column. And since this exhibit is about the geometrization of the divine, um, I wanted to just alert us to that. Um, and one of the concepts come up in that chapter is called embodied mathematics. So how does, for, for me, the column is a ritual art. You know, it's not art separate from ritual. So that's very important. It's not um, just beauty. Uh, it's embodied beauty. It's ethics in, in, in engendered inside of beauty. So here you have sort of simple a fractal design of you know three dots and then you have seven dots and then you have a much larger one. So you see the kind of sub categorization how women learn the columns is through the simple subsets and then combining the subsets into larger you know you know one four and then nine of the of the subsets. Um, this is again another principle that came up is symmetry in the columns, um, how much there's a lot of mirrored selves in the column. Um, this is an unusual one because it's sort of half symmetry in a sense. And this, I just want to end with this. Um, this is absolutely the most gorgeous one I've seen. And this took about two hours for this 14 year old girl to make. And it was in the little town of Mailardure, where it's translated as where the peacocks dance. Um, and later on, I found out, you know, decades later, years later, that my mother actually spent a year in that town. Um, and I just felt, when I got there, I felt a really great affection, you know, in that, uh, in that place. Um, and so one of the things I talk, you know, that's very embedded within the Kolam tradition is symmetry. And as I mentioned, fractals. And then I discovered a whole slew of computer scientists who've been working on picture languages and array grammars. And so for 40 years, they've, they've been very inspired by these column designs to understand how electrons move in space. Um, and so they've been, it's, you know, I summarized some of their research, but it was beyond my, you know, um, capacity to really comprehend the fullness of it, but I referred to some of that. And then I had mentioned also infinity as well. Um, one uh, person that I also really got to know um, as a friend was a, a wonderful woman named Chandra Leka, um, who was a dancer uh, and choreographer. Um, she passed away some years ago. And she talked about geometrization of the column and how she applied this into her choreography as well. Um, and one of the things she talked about um, is a couple of quotes I wanted to just read out of hers. Uh, one of them she said is, in terms of the body or the embodiment of the body, Mandala is a holistic concept integrating the human body with itself, with the community, and with the environment. It generates a centered, tensile, and complex visual form. It's a principle of power, of stability, of balance, of holding the earth, of squaring or circularizing the body, and of breaking the tension and rigidity of the vertical line by a curve. So she applied uh, you know, these principles into her dance choreography. And I still remember the moment when she talked about infinity and the column, you know, for herself. So she looked at me intensely and explained, one time I made columns nonstop for a few days. I kept on making variations and new designs. After some time of playing around with this kind of geometric thinking and feeling, everything around me became points, dancing points in space, stretching out towards infinity, unquote. So she saw herself as a very vibrant, pulsating, activated point in space, similar to each of the dots in the column. Perhaps, as Chandraleka eloquently and movingly points out, the column is indeed a small way to glimpse infinity. It is as though in a very subtle, unassuming way, the column, when drawn in pulley patterns, could be seen as a small piece of cloth pulled down closer to the ground, as if it was puckered down onto the ground from an infinite series of dots that imaginatively stretch in all directions. So I just wanted to stop there and um, much more to say, but this is just a tiny glimpse of the column and some of the mathematics um, of, of the column. So thank you so much for your attention. And I will just stop the share of the screen. There we go. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagarjan. I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions for all three of you. This has been wonderful. Um, Justin? Are you with us? Hi. Thank you so much. Those were 
three fascinating, uh, amazing um, presentations. I really enjoyed them. And I have some questions for all three of you. Uh, so I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Kassam. Um, so I was thinking about uh, the music. Um, it seemed that the, um, the music that you, uh, the Garbies that you presented, uh, I wanted to know if they were tied to the seasonal calendar. Uh, one of the things that I learned about from my guru, who also, uh, Om Prakash, he was also a sitar player. Uh, he, he was friends with uh, a, a guy named uh, Ravi Shankar, who you may have known <laughs> about. Uh, they both had the same sitar teacher. Um, but he, he taught me that ragas have, um, there are evening ragas, there are morning ragas, there are afternoon ragas, there are ragas for the autumn, there are ragas for the spring. And so my question is, uh, for these garbies, are there similar uh, garbies that are done uh, for different times of the calendar? Are they... Uh, tied to times of fertility, equinoxes, solstices, um, or are they enacted uh, simply by the spiritual needs of the community? Dr. Kasim, you're muted. Okay, so well, thank you for that question. Um, typically, there are four um, Navratris celebrated, or four times in, in, in the year. And the one that is uh, the one that's practiced or, or celebrated most frequently is the autumn one. Um, that's specific to the rituals that are performed around Navratri. But the form of Garbi is such that basically any uh, celebration, and this includes weddings, and you know harvest time and so forth you'd have garbies that are recited specific to that particular occasion they're not uh, sort of uh, only uh, restricted to a religious context and so in that sense yes there are garbies but the way to distinguish them in in a sense is first of all the form but especially the lyrics or you know the songs themselves this is how we might be able to tell where a garbi actually belongs. And right now it's extraordinary, but the garbis are so popular that you might form, find them in almost any, you know, in, in any social context. Uh, I am not aware of garbis being uh, linked to say um, a particular, the way rags are linked to a particular time in the day or a, a ragini, you know, to a particular deity. I'm not uh, aware of something like that happening with the garbies, but I, I would say that in order to identify what a garbi is really about is to look at the lyrics themselves. Okay, okay. Uh, and I also noticed that in the, uh, in the videos that you played, it seemed that uh, it was mostly uh, young men and young women uh, are the Garbies also something that um, the community, uh, people of all different ages participate in? Uh, or is this something that is mostly for, uh, like you say, weddings or a particular uh, age group? So I, I really wanted to show that video of the, the, it's actually a movie. And I wanted to specifically show this one because you have a sense more of, you know, the folk practice of Garbi and probably what it looked like once upon a time. And it was, uh, I, if you recall that painting of the Garbi context or situation for Pir Shams, really this is a form that uh, is uh, danced by women. You know, it was participated, the main participants were women. And the Dandia that you see in that film was basically the women um, playing with these sticks, a very vigorous form of Garbi. But the original Garbi, we think, is actually more woman-focused or women-centered. 
um, sorry, I'm sort of, uh, yeah, so is it, is it a mixed audience? Well, right now it is. As I said, you know, when you look at the, the reason I chose that film is because we might get more of a sense of how that tradition is performed or practiced within a, a regional, I mean, a village context, but it's very, very hard to find right now examples of what, such as the one that I showed. Mostly mm -hmm. what we have is really contemporary forms or practices that are much, much more in a secular context. And it's really like a, a dance form, like any other dance form to, for enjoyment. And there you do have, you know, um, mixed, uh, men and women dancing together. If you recall the very first slide that I showed of the, uh, you know, the, the one in South India, I don't know if you noticed that both men and women were actually partnering up and it was very fluid kind of a situation. You'll find that quite frequently, but at the same time, you'll find more um, choreographed versions of uh, the Garbis performed, you know, so for instance, if you might have the bride and the groom actually w watching a Garbi performance. So you have professional mm -hmm. kinds of uh, presentations of the Garbi, but you also have very communal, let's have some fun types of Garbi performances or dances. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my next uh, question is for Dr. Barush. Um, you uh, were talking about pilgrimages and uh, so pilgrimage is essentially sacred journey, right? So it's marked by a call, a departure, right? A journey, a, a destination, an enlightenment, and then a return. And your talk was on the pilgrimage of the eye. So now that we're sort of in this uh, COVID time where we can't really do a lot of bodily pilgrimage, pilgrimaging. <laughs> um, do you think that uh, we are, uh, that we are suffering in a sense from being denied the challenge of bodily pilgrimage? Because there's a certain amount of uh, difficulty and challenge that comes along from pilgrimage that not just from um, the reception of the knowledge that comes in from the eye. It's not just going to uh, see the sight or to have the um, understanding, but actually to engage the entire embodied experience. The eye is one part of the body. Uh, it is the it's the organ of admission, um, but it's the, it, it is, it's the point of contact for an entire lead up of experience. And which, which I would argue takes place uh, well before you get to the point where you've, where you're, you've apprehended the, the work of art. Um, and in my um, studies on temples, right, there's, there's, the, there's the lead up to the temple, there's the usually some sort of guardians, right, and then there's the, the steps into, into the porch, and then there's the, the entry, and, and you're always teles uh, telescoping inward, 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 uh, until you get to the, the the sacred mystery at the center. So there's a whole embodied experience in this. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that a bit. Um, what do we, what do we lose and what do we gain by um, sort of having great access to all this amazing art but also losing a sense of our bodily connection. Yeah, thanks, Justin. That's, that's a really he great and huge um, question that I think we could spend a long, a long time exploring. I mean, um, I guess uh, Hugh and Richard of St. Victor, the 12th century mystic theologians that I mentioned, 
make the case for the eye as a cycle of vision that creates an experience of full embodiment. So they would say that that, that that tactility of the eye actually engaged the whole body as well as the soul. And in addition to that, they would argue for an extra temporal experience. Um, but I think, you know, what you're getting at more is like the, the experience of walking, especially a circuitous path, something like a labyrinth where you're moving in towards a sacred center and out and out again, and how that, how the, how the body, mo how the bodily movement, um, you know, can create an experience of solace or peace or a meditative experience or indeed, you know, sort of closeness with the divine. And, um, and of course on Hajj, uh, you know, it's when, it's when people are on airplanes, they're not actually, you know, they're not, people don't normally walk to Hajj. I mean, maybe some do, I don't know if, if anybody wants to remark about that, but it's a lot of people fly, right? But there's a point when you're on the airplane that you put on the sacred garment of a pilgrim. So there's this like moment of preparing your body um, as you enter even even over, even as you're flying above, right? Bird's eye view as you're entering into the sacred space. Um, but I think an interesting alternative has been, uh, you know, the, the sort of do-it-yourself pilgrimages that have cropped up um, around this time of COVID. And I think that there's this wonderful relationship here with um, Dr. Nag Nagajaran's uh, talk about the, with the chalk, um, or I guess they're not, the rice, rice powder, uh, these ephemeral kind of rice uh, powder images, right? That you can engage with your body as you make it. So there's like an experience of gesture and embodiment. You can also look at them with your eye. And um, this has been happening with chalk labyrinths. And uh, early on in the, in the pandemic, I had written a little article about labyrinths and, um, and all of a sudden they started to crop up all over Berkeley. It, Sephora Markson, who's our marketing person, went out with Benjamin who takes the GTU videos. They were inspired to create this wonderful chalk labyrinth in a public park. And it was great because it was like, it was like no other labyrinth I'd ever seen because they actually wrote kind of joyful things that you could do with your body as you negotiated this, which actually relates mm -hmm. to Dr. Kassam's talk on dance and movement um, because they actually said, you know, uh, smile here, you know, turn your body here, lean down, move, you know, twist. And it, it gave you kind of instruction, leap, jump for joy as you negotiated this wonderful kind of sacred path. So, um, so the I thing, I don't know. I mean, I, I think some people are convinced that the eye leads to a, a cycle of vision or the finger, you know, if you're doing a finger labyrinth that that can create an ex that it can through a channel to your soul can create a fully embodied experience. But um, I'll leave it to the 12th and 14th century mystics to convince you on that point. But I think, um, but I think what people can do actually is bring if, if you want to engage your whole body in a, in a way where you're actually stepping one foot in front of the other, you know, there's, there's wonderful ways that you could do this with, um, with gardens and with ephemeral materials that we've been, that actually kind of, um, that, that is a theme that, that was, that you can trace kind of through all three panel presentations this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, as, as, a, as an artist, as a painter, I can, tell you that um, one of the important things in painting is that s the scale of a, a, a painting is very important. So for example, Ohm's work, the ones that uh, we showed you, those, those mandalas are very big. And to, to, st to stand in front of one and, and be bathed in that light uh, is a very visceral experience of color. Uh, it's a very different experience than seeing it on your screen. Uh, so, and, you, you know, being there physically is different than, than being here, you know, with my, my iPhone. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. Uh, so my last uh, question for uh, Dr. Nagarajan is, about the columns and I really really enjoyed your talk and I think these things are amazing and one of the things that Om always talked about with me I would ask him about his paintings and he would always describe them as offerings because <laughs> you know in the west we 
we don't talk about art in that way. Yeah. We make art as Western artists, we make art for, you know, for, 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 for creativity and for, to make money and, you know, and to have, uh, you know, to express ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Self-expression. But he would always talk about them in terms of offerings yeah. Yeah. to the divine. And, and I can see that uh, this is a, something that is just soaked into the cultures of India. Mm -hmm. And when I went there and traveled around with him, I could, you can see that it's, it's in every pore of that culture, those, all the many cultures that make up India. So, um, and certainly with the columns. Uh, and these designs are very deceptively complex. And I wanted to ask you about how these are passed on from uh, older women to younger women. Uh, is there a Guru Shishka uh, tradition? Is there a, a tradition of passing them on? Uh, do children make them? You, you, you mentioned that your mother was making them up into her mm -hmm. 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and following on that, um, you mentioned that uh, there was a, they 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 operate as um a sort of a public um sign uh to the community uh about what's happening in the house is there one woman in the house uh who is responsible for the columns of the house and does she um train if there's many women in the house does she train the other women and then the third question would be, uh, um, did you find in your research that there were designs that seemed regional uh, or, or is it diffused throughout wherever the Tamil people went? Is it sort of, is, is there sort of a pan, pan Tamil um, aesthetic? that went wherever it went, uh, wherever the Tamil people uh, 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 went, or, it, or are there regional variations in the, in the design sensibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dustin, beautiful questions. Um, Thank you. And, you know, again, you know, like everyone else said, you know, you could spend a whole lot of time on any one of those questions. Um, I'll just start with the third one, uh, just because that's the, you know, the, the most straightforward, I think, or, you know, it's, it's definitely inflected by caste and class and, uh, you know, religious sensibility. So you have, for example, you know, Christians who often do the columns on the thresholds, like with Christian, like for Christmas, et cetera. Um, you also have, uh, you know, Buddhists and Jains often do them as well uh, in Tamil Nadu. Um, and the, you know, you often can identify, you know, women amongst each other, especially like if they're in Chennai or if they're in bigger cities like Madurai, they'll be able to say, oh, that person is from Tanjavur because that's a Tanjavur kolam, you know, or, or that person must be from Sriviliputur, a small town in, you know, the extreme south, which is where Andal was born, because that kolam pattern is the way that it's shaped or the way that it's curved um, is that's what Sriviliputur women do, you know. So, Definitely, they're inflected by caste, class, region. Um, I would say in the last 20, 30 years, um, those have gotten a lot more, um, what's the word, uh, you know, shared. You know, they're, they're not as fixed, you know. And they're, I would say that the pulli columns have become, in a way, the most popular because they're the most, um, and they're most bewitching to the eye, I think. You know, the square columns uh, are done by certain subcasts um, and they're done still for puja areas and for the threshold areas and for special occasions. But really the puli columns have, I think, um, really expanded their, um, their uh, what's the word, you know, the hands. You know, the hands that make the puli columns are, uh, you know, uh, have gone beyond caste or class. And I would say those are the those are the, and those are the ones that are made famous by the computer scientists and the mathematicians. Those are the ones that they're studying. 
um, in detail and for the mathematical properties. Um, and then also, I think I mentioned the different names for the regions throughout India and around the world, you know, that those uh, patterns that have cousins, I would say, you know, even like the pulley columns, they're in Angola, you know, uh, and, and there's, you know, mathematicians who studied those patterns and they're very similar to the columns. Um, and you've got tattoo designs in New Guinea, you know, so um, with no relationship to the Tamil, you know, explicitly. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, there's, um, uh, there's, those are inflections. Um, there was also a Muslim teenage boy I met in a competition, column competition, and he was doing the column secretly. This was in Madurai. And his mother was very supportive, but his grandmother wasn't. So even my interview of him had to be done kind of in a, in a closed setting. Um, and, you know, I asked him why he loved the column so much. And he would go against his grandmother and against his father to go and do these column competitions. And he said he just fell in love with the designs. And he just, you know, he saw it more as an art, you know, um, but his mother was extremely supportive of him, you know, to do them. Um, and then I guess, you know, in terms of the, the second question about the handing down of the tradition, um, it's, it's interesting, you know, there are, every woman is supposed to do the kona, right, every Tamil woman, but the range of expertise varies because some women, my mother was even saying this, you know, the other day, she said, you know, some women like her, she's a great column maker, spend all their, as much of their non-column making time dwelling in their imagination on the column. So even when they're cooking or they're cleaning and they're thinking about the designs and they have column notebooks and they're practicing whenever they can. So then those people who are obsessed in a way, what we call really obsessed with the column will become great column makers. But it's only necessary and sufficient to be a decent column maker, an average column maker, a simple column maker for the ritual act of doing one every morning. And so, um, and then the, the, the training of them is really informal, you know, um, it's not done in an explicit way. It's really, you're watching the women in your family make them as a child, and then you practice on your own. And then sometimes you might be asked, well, you go do the column now, you know, and then you have to start doing it, right? And I remember, at, you know, in Mother, when I was living there, um, there was one time when a two and a half year old, you know, who was living in the downstairs um, apartment below me, she was critiquing her grandmother's column the aesthetics of it. I was stunned. You know, she said, Pati, this is a terrible column. Why do you make such beautiful columns in Bangalore when you come and visit us there? But this is a terrible column, very sloppy that you're making this column. And I was like, wait, how old is this kid? This kid is two and a half years old. So afterwards, I, I you know, talked to the grandmother. And what the grandmother said to the child and, and answered and said, well, you know, I'm a lot busier at home. And I don't have much time. But when I'm in Bangalore, I'm visiting you. I'm your guest and I don't have to do a lot of household work so I can I can dwell on the column much more. So it shows that the aesthetic training is starts at a very young age of what is beautiful, what is not beautiful, what is etc. You know. And then I think, you know, I love the question about the rituals of generosity. I think, you know, the column, I think we need to map out the visual grammar of rituals of generosity, you know, especially in this moment of time. Because I feel like, you know, <laughs> We're living in a, you know, sort of 500 year world of capitalism and the rituals of greed and rituals of selfishness. And so we need to kind of remind ourselves, you know, in every culture and every time and space, there were maps of rituals of generosity. And I think they're there, they're hidden, we don't even see them. And I would say that they're part of the gift economy, you know, in general. And I'd really recommend a brilliant book, um, uh, really a genius level book at one of the genius award, you know, uh, Lewis Hyde's The Gift, The Erotic Life of Property. And it's a brilliant book about creativity, exactly what you're talking about, the gift of creativity and what it means to, as an, as an artist, to come from the realm of generosity, of, of dhanam, to give. And this is, you know, from the Western tradition, you know, not necessarily from, I mean, he's a, he looks at anthropology too, and the anthropology of gift giving um, and the circularity of gift, gift giving. And I'm just fascinated by this whole category of gift giving, which the column is a part of, of non-symmetrical gift giving. In other words, it's not an equal exchange. It's 
you give without like just giving to the world without having any expectations or hopes of return. And in fact, you don't want a return, a direct return, because then the value of the gift is redu reduced because you're doing it with an intention of de wanting, desire something back, right? Yeah. So it's really how do you train yourself to give with no desire of return, you know? And what the Feeding a Thousand Souls really is about is, and this was stunning to me when I discovered this and it took me a while to figure out that puzzle, is that the reason the column is made, perhaps, is that, and women would tell me to feed a thousand souls, but I wanted to get to the deeper meaning of this, is that I found a third century footnote, you know, the Dharma Shastras. <laughs> Footnotes are fantastic. They've changed my life. <laughs> um, and this footnote talked about that when a house is built, that the sin, the human sin, of making all the animals that lived in that area before the house was built, making them all homeless. There is nothing you can do, no good karma in your life that you can do that would compensate ever for making of those innumerable infinite animals homeless. From the smallest earthworm to the ants to the bigger creatures that you've kicked out in order to build your human house. And so the column is a reminder, it should be a reminder to you every day, what have you done to be a householder? And there's, you know, this is a simple, small way to give back to those animals whose houses you've stolen. That's, I just wanted to end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone so much, Justin. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions. Thank you to our panelists and their wonderful presentations. Um, we are going to wrap up now, but before we end today, I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank the Doug Adams Gallery, Dean Elizabeth Pena and Lydia Webster for their support and help with this project, as well as to thank Dr. Rita Sherma and Laura Dunn at the Center for Dharma Studies for their help and guidance. Dr. Munir Jiwa, Majameen Dalla, and Carol Beer with the Center for Islamic Studies. Thank you all so much for your help and support at every stage of this project. And especially thank you to each of the 14 incredible artists who have shared their work and a little bit of their own spiritual journeys with us in order to help facilitate that discussion. And for that gift, we are eternally grateful. This collaborative and interdisciplinary project owes its success to the help, guidance, support, and contribution of these wonderful scholars and artists. Thank you again, Dr. Qasim, Dr. Barouche, and Dr. Nagarjan, and Justin for your wonderful presentations and questions. Thank all of you for joining us. And please, incur I encourage you to, um, if you haven't already, please visit drawingthesoul.com to uh, visit our, um, our exhibition, which is going to be online. That website will be active until January 1 of 2021. Um, so please, please visit. Um, perhaps keep Dr. Bruce's questions in mind as you go on your own pilgrimage of the eye. Um, you know, feel free to reach out if there are questions or if, if you observe something you would like to share as part of this exhibition. Um, you also then can read about the artists and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and what went into their work. Thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart. And I wish you all a wonderful evening and a very peaceful and restful weekend. And for those of you celebrating, happy Diwali. Yeah, happy Diwali <laughs> to everyone. And thank you to everyone for coming and being present. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all the professors. Zoom clap, yes. <laughs> there is an applause. It's not audible, but it's there. Yeah. <laughs>